nice to see everybody, uh, CRE Tech attendees. Uh, also, where are all of my real disruption regulars? Who's been at a real disruption over the last four years? Thank you very much. When we started this conversation about real estate tech, we didn't call it re-tech, we called it something. Uh, we didn't know what it was, how it was gonna turn out. And in that time, we've had eight events with over a thousand people, uh, with uh, now, we started with about 10 startups on that list. I had 10 companies to choose from for the first panel. It was our, our friends um, uh, at, uh, uh, at View the Space. It was Nick Romito and it was uh, Jonathan Wasserstrom. And now our database at MIT, we're looking at this stuff all the time, is up over 2,300. I know Brad's database is bigger than that. But it, to give you a sense, this is the magnitude of what's going on in the real estate tech space, and a lot of you have been following it as we've been further pursuing this at MIT and in the industry. So I'll, uh, we're at a point now after four years that instead of talking about the startups, which was, is always cool, let's talk about some of the trends that we're seeing because we're at an interesting, uh, we're at a point in the, in the innovation life cycle and the startup life cycle that is useful to know. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of things. The first is, for those of you who know me, uh, we love this concept of real estate fracking, which is Dennis, uh, Professor Dennis Frenchman talks about this. I'll tell you what that is. Uh, we're also seeing the UI and or the UX of, of real estate, which is the user interface, for those of you who are tech people, or the UX, the user experience then uh, real estate is getting smarter. I'll talk about a couple of different aspects to that, and we're gonna do it all in 22 and a half minutes or less. So, here we go. Uh, fasten your seatbelts. Real estate fracking. Real estate fracking is where the asset, the use of the asset gets broken into smaller pieces and reconfigured into higher value combinations. Gets broken into, broken into pieces, reconfigured in higher value combinations. Dennis Frenchman. Two great examples, co-working and Airbnb. We work now the second largest occupier in New York, first largest in London, I think, right? And uh, Airbnb, the largest hotel company in the world, doesn't own a bed yet. So aside from those, there are changes happening in the co-working space that we think are interesting. And here are some different examples. It's, they're starting to specialize, they're starting to morph, they're starting to go into combinations. Uh, Industrious is, uh, is a, uh, a more boutique solution. Biolabs, if you're a scientist coming out of MIT looking for a place to work on your molecule that you've developed, that you've patented, you need a place to do that and biotech space is very expensive. VCs aren't gonna fund it. And so you go to a place called Biolabs, which is one example of co-working for biotech. So cybertech, co-working for cyber technology in the Bay Area. A bunch of different examples. Anybody heard of Paragon? co-working for the cannabis business. <laughs> Love that one. Okay, so, and you can imagine the munchie bar they have there. Um, work bar, is Bill Jacobson here? Bill, work bar is a very, in, so we're talking about fracking. So work bar is an interesting example. This is co-working. This is a regional New England base. If you haven't met Bill, he's great. They just opened three co-working spaces inside of Staples. So this is like double fracking. They're already fracking the work environment, but now they're going into Staples because what does Staples have? a lot of real estate. So these are the kinds of solutions that are starting to show up in the co-working uh, realm, but there are others that are not necessarily co-working, and some of these will look familiar. Uh, liquid space for empty meeting rooms, that's how they started out, for empty boardrooms in offices, pivot desk for empty desks, uh, a breather for chill space, in the retail space appear here and storefront and some other examples of providing pop-up space. Again, this is, this is taking an asset that's sitting empty and figuring out how to unlock the value that's locked, just like oil and gas fracking where we're unlocking the value that got orphaned in the ground. Flip and Y Hotel, multifamily people? Multifamily people? Uh, flip is kind of interesting. This is a, uh, a way to give people kind of a FICO score so that you can flip in and out of uh, uh, apartments, uh, leases. So leases may not look like 12 months anymore. It may be kind of by the month all the time. But the person who takes over has to be pre-qualified. Why hotel? Anybody seen Why hotel? Uh, yeah? Uh, interesting. This is a pop-up hotel in a multifamily building while you're going through lease-up. Think about if you're going through a slow lease up, you know, in a, fire, in, a, in a market that's on fire, you may be pre-leased, but if you've got a building that's going through lease up, you have an opportunity to monetize on a temporary basis. They go in, do the pop-up hotel, and then they're gone at 90%. Interesting. 
uh, on the industrial side, Flexi for, for, uh, for pallet space, Dark Store, this is an interesting, any, anybody heard of Dark Store? Heard of this one? Yeah, I know, I'll talk later. Um, dark Store, Th this, is, this is kind of temporary, last mile uh, fulfillment and distribution space. This is, this is an industrial play in the neighborhood because we're trying to solve this last mile problem. Um, these guys, Spacious is interesting, these are three similar, they're looking at any space. Spacious said, wait a minute, we're in New York, restaurants, middle of the afternoon, all those empty tables, could we book those out? Could we book out tables for a work group and go in for two hours and book it on our phone and you get, you get free beverages, no food, and the restaurant gets to make a little money off the, off the activity in the middle of the afternoon. So, Again, this kind of approach that the, that the startups are doing, smarking, an MIT startup, optimizing parking, another area where we're, we need to optimize in order to better monetize our real estate. Anybody used Recharge? This is, oh, hold your hands up, hold your hands up. This is hotel space by the minute. These are hotel rooms by the minute. For the, and as Brad says, for the right reasons. I mean, the jokes almost write themselves on this one. But all kidding aside, just imagine when is the downtime in the hotel? It's the middle of the afternoon, two, three hours. They've got to service them. Nobody's making any money off of it. But importantly, some of their portfolio includes uh, the Pierre, some W locations, some Hyatt locations, and Ace, Ace, and Ace Hotel. So uh, again, these are, this is this fracking concept taken well beyond co-working. And so it's worth keeping in mind that this is, I mean, Mark Grinnis from EY says that commercial real estate is no longer a fixed asset. Whoa, we're in an industry where I always assumed real estate was a fixed asset. So that's one of our big themes that we're seeing, and I think it's going to continue in many different forms and variations. Okay, the UI and UX of real estate, three subgroups, three subgroups. Uh, but first I'll say, uh, this is part of the fact that, that the users in the building are moving toward experience and away from worrying about the structure. So we, you know there's an, increased, there's an intense focus, an increased focus on how the building is used and what the users want. And so there are three subgroups on this. One is a bunch of, a bunch of companies that are taking a look at how can management better understand and interact with the building and understand what's going on in the building. So uh, some different examples, some of them use Wi-Fi, they're using beacons, they're using a combination of both. Uh, Humanize is an MIT startup, they use access cards. Uh, also team and Robin uh, take, uh, monitoring all the activity and just in meeting rooms. Imagine the immense amount of data that, get, uh, that gets gathered as a result of how people move in this space. So that's, that's one way in this way. Now, management can also interact with the tenant and there are different ways to do that. On the office side, these are some examples. Zoe is a, is a Tishman proprietary uh, uh, example, but the, the Equium just moved to New York from Australia. These are, these are examples of how owners and operators can better interact and interface with the users because it's about what the users want will, will dictate how we run our buildings. And then on the, on the multifamily side, there are a bunch of them on the multifamily side as well. And then lastly, there's, there's this new, because of technology, there's this new approach, which is to source the information from the users directly. So now we can crowdsource information from users to better understand how to run our buildings. And so these are familiar to you, I, uh, 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 both in Boston and not in Boston. Tenovox is one that I just uh, uncovered. Tenovox is Yelp for office buildings. Uh-oh. That I think is a good thing, but we know Yelp is challenging. So it's putting the power in the users. Just what we need to know is that it's putting the power in the hands of the users. And what that means, Chris Kelly from Convene says what talent wants, landlords need, developers must build. This is 180 degrees different from what we've been accustomed to. Okay, last group, AI and machine learning. It's really not about the AI and the machine learning, it's about the immense amounts of data that we have and how we're possibly gonna process it all and understand what it means. And so Moore's Law is going on here. Uh, EMC says we'll have 44 trillion gigabytes by 2020. 44 trillion gigabytes, my phone's got 150 gigabytes in it. It's just an immense amount of data. So we aren't, we aren't lacking data. The challenge is that 
we need to be able to understand it and use it to make decisions. Um, just from a cell phone standpoint, this is global, but uh, an eight times increase from two exabytes to 18 exabytes by, by 2020. Uh, huge amounts of data. So um, also the distinction between artificial intelligence and machine learning, artificial intelligence has been around a while. You could say it's the algorithms. The machine learning is the next step, and I won't go into neural networks and all of this stuff, but the, the, what, what's going to happen is they'll start learning from analyzing the data. It's starting to show up. We know from the, our non-real estate life, Amazon, Waze, Siri, Google Translate, they're all getting smarter. I know because Waze used to send me to Worcester, Massachusetts, and now it sends me to Worcester, Massachusetts. So something went on there. And also Google Translate, because we have our MIT alums are all over the world. I translate, Mandarin doesn't quite work, but most uh, of the languages translate pretty darn well so that I can communicate to other countries. So with that going on, where's it showing up in real estate? It's just starting to show up. And so we've got a couple of examples in brokerage and sales, uh, helping smaller uh, listings, helping smaller brokerages do it a little better. First is kind of interesting. They've modeled who, this is a residential play, who is prone to list their house? So imagine how you would model that. You would model that with birth and death and job loss and transfer and empty nesters and divorce and anything that could impact why you might be willing to sell so that brokers can determine who's gonna list their house. It's pretty neat. It's not as easy as it sounds, but it's pretty neat. Then site location, a company called Locate AI is uh, uh, trying to figure out how to better do site location using artificial intelligence. On the appraisal side, Oriva and Bowery. Bowery, a US company, Oriva, a UK company. I think, the, anybody here in the appraisal business? <laughs> Are you? JLL. Yeah, well, JLL, a little, okay, JLL. Anybody else in the appraisal business? Good, if you're in the appraisal business, you really gotta look at this stuff because it's gonna change, <laughs> it's gonna change. Um, acquisition valuation, these are a bunch of examples. Um, Enodo score on multifamily, House Canary on single family. Uh, Skyline just got a big slug of money. This is a, a, a Tel Aviv based company uh, on, on commercial asset valuations using this sophisticated uh, knowledge and understanding. So uh, uh, contracts. Uh, you may have heard of Leverton. Leverton's doing a lot of trials. Brevistone, Beagle's a UK solution. Imagine what happens if you take a, a portfolio of 1,000 leases and you can abstract them from multiple languages into English with a dashboard and a summary and you do it with a click of a button. So imagine, I know what it took with accountants and lawyers and people to do that and how many weeks it took. Now you can do it pretty quickly, really quickly. Uh, lastly, personal assistance. We, um, just some recent announcements, no surprise, we're going to see uh, Spark, we're going to see Alexa, we're going to see the assistants that we use right now for personal use are going to start showing up in an enterprise solution, and that's going to be enabled by the technology. So, key takeaways so that I can stay on time. Uh, we've got fracking and real estate as a service. Uh, optimization of the asset, uh, uh, certainly important, the user interface is important. This means there's going to be increased velocity. We're gonna, we're gonna have increased transparency because we have more data. We're gonna understand the data. Increased transparency, uh, more velocity. There'll be more deals because the deals will happen faster because there's less friction. Significantly more data. And then, uh, and just a comment on where we are in the, in the cycle. So we talked about where we were four years ago, kind of where we are now with a hint of the future. And the panel is going to talk about more of this in depth. But, so in the startup cycle, you, most of you know that Hightower was acquired by VTS. Uh, Floored is now part of CBRE. Pivot Desk is now part of Industrious. Uh, Comstack is integrated with a couple of different interesting plays. Uh, Trusts and Matterports and Spacelist have gotten together. So the, because a question I get often is when are we gonna get a platform? When am I gonna be able to give up the 20 apps that I have so that I can just use one or two? And that's a great question. I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're starting to see some consolidations and some API sharing and things like that, so we're heading there. And on the VC side, uh, this is slightly outdated, but, but last year the expectation would be that we would hit three billion. Did we, we, did we go over three billion last year? By a lot, by a lot. Uh, but if you back out a couple of the huge deals, it's a little skewed, but nonetheless, that, that 2011 bar that isn't up there was only about 150, 150 million. 
This is just to give you an idea, when you have this amount of venture capital going into the tech space, we're going to have a lot of stuff happen. And, and Brad Grywe is here, uh, thrilled to have him here. He's going to talk a little bit about that. So the other thing that's happening that I think is exciting, uh, Fifth Wall, Brad's going to talk about Fifth Wall, uh, Navitas and, and some of the other VCs are either doing specialized investing with uh, real estate investors, or they, they, we're starting to get some focus. This didn't, three years ago, this wasn't happening. So we're starting to get some focus and some interesting relationships between the brokerages and accelerators and VC uh, and in a lot of different combinations and ways that we didn't see two or three years ago. And this means to me that the industry is all in on this stuff. We don't quite know what it's gonna turn out to look like, but the industry is definitely all in. And with that, uh, before we introduce the panel, I'll take a few questions. We covered a lot of ground, and there's some topics I didn't cover. Uh, we didn't have time to get to quite everything. So, any questions that I can answer? Like a deer in headlights. Any questions? Nobody's gonna ask about blockchain? Nobody's gonna ask about blockchain? We'll get you a microphone. Uh, this platform that, that doesn't exist yet, <laughs> uh, will it be a competitor to, uh, to uh, will, it, will, it, will it put out, yeah, will it put out a business co-star? <laughs> oh, that's a great first question. <laughs> Thanks for that, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, no. I don't, I don't think so. I, by the way, this is just me saying I don't think so. I think there's so much work to be done on better running the business that there are lots of other opportunities and the legacy companies will always be around. I would suggest you take a look at MRI. MRI is doing some interesting things. They have a portfolio. This is a legacy company. They've got, uh, they've got uh, enterprise solutions. They are signing deals with startups that are kind of um, partnership deals. They're making some acquisitions. They're incubating in-house. Um, I don't quite know how I don't quite know how that's going to turn out yet, um, but we it'll it will uh, it eventually has to sort it sort itself out I think. And as far as the other question, I can't I can't predict that I can't predict that. Other questions? Still nobody asked about blockchain. Amazing. AVs autonomous vehicles. Okay, we're good. With that, I will say uh, thank. Oh wait. Where am I investing my money? I'm still paying off my law school loans. <laughs> well, well the, uh, so I will say that the question has come from the industry, from people, because we, this, the center has lots of people like you who are involved and stop by the center or involved with our research. It's still unclear. Uh, one, one description I heard was very interesting. It was a very successful real estate person who told me, he said, Steve, Many of these solutions really peel off my margins. So I think I need to shift some of my capital allocation to get involved in real estate tech because I want to recapture some of those margins. And I, I think that might be one way of looking at it to understand that, that the industry is going to be impacted and we can either just let it happen to us or we can try to get out ahead of it. <laughs> 